April 27th, we back. It's 840 on the West Coast. Jay, my brother, how you doing, man? I'm doing great. Hey, don't don't y'all just love when uh when your best player or second best player gambles on a steal 30 feet from the basket on a game point that leads to <laughs> <laughs> leads to a layup. Uh, but anyways, what up, G Foster, my guy back Hello. In what up? How I you am, feeling? I'm great, man. <laughs> I uh, I am dressed in all black today for a funeral. I have eulogies to deliver um, and just feeling feeling good, man, Greg. Well, hey, we are so happy to have you uh, back on, Greg, especially with um, this uh, th- this funeral that you're going to attend this uh, Utah Jazz funeral. We had to uh, bring you on. To, uh, to 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 speak on on this team, man, uh, definitely just one of these teams that are going to get cr- deconstructed then during this offseason, man. So we just want to In, get you. Inshallah, man. Like, <laughs> please. <laughs> so we definitely just wanted to get your opinion on uh, on the on that jazz series and all these other ones, man. So that's exactly what we got going on today, man. But before we get into it, man, everybody, make sure you guys go show Greg some love, man. Go check him out at the unsav- Unsavageable, the YouTube Utah Jazz podcast, um, very knowledgeable podcast, and man, that's why we had to bring my guy Greg on, man. So you, you guys ready to get into this uh, NBA playoffs recap? Let's go, always, always. Let's get let's get straight into it, man. Let's start with the first series over here in the West Coast, which is what we've been doing on all these other uh, recap episodes, and that's been this Suns versus Pelican series. That man's got a lot it so more. Much. I, it's gotten a lot more interesting. I'll say that it's gotten a lot more interesting. I uh, know a lot of people expected a sweep or a gentleman's sweep on this one, but with D book going now. Um, man, the Pelicans stepped up. we able to tie the series 2-2 up until last night. Uh, the Suns were able to pull that one off. But what are some thoughts that you guys have on that series? What are some X factors you guys are seeing? Um, Jay, I know we've been talking about this. So, Greg, I don't know if you want to go ahead and sound off. Let us know how you feel about this series. One, uh, the Pelicans are going to be really good next year, especially if they get Zion mm-hmm. back. Like, imagine that starting mm-hmm. five, but you're replacing Jackson Hayes with Zion Williamson. Mm-hmm. Like they're gonna be, they're gonna be so tough. Um, Brandon Ingram continues to impress. Like, I think he's. I mean, I think he's a star. I know he didn't make the All Star game, but that doesn't mean that somebody doesn't have a star quality. And they just like the the addition of CJ McCollum just gives them another guy who can who can run the offense, who can get a bucket, and he's actually playing his. Uh, intended position he doesn't have to play off ball he can actually play point guard which is what cj mccollum is and i think he's just that that like perfect missing link for that team uh i really like them but then on the other side like phoenix is showing you why they were the best team in the league like and they have guys stepping up chris paul isn't completely healthy d books on the bench but you got guys like campaign showing out deandre ayton had that big 30 point game um Mikel Bridges was incredible last night. What do you have? Like 24, 26 points in the second half, like while playing all everything defense, like uh, Cam Johnson, another guy who's stepped up. Like they just have so much depth and they just have guys who aren't afraid of the moment and know, like know what they have to do, even when they're superstars out. Um, it's going to be really interesting to see what happens after this series. Cause I think, you know, I think it's almost a foregone conclusion that the Suns are going to win this series at this point, but what happens in the latter rounds, if D book can't go like hamstrings are very fickle. They take a long time to heal and they can be re-aggravated like that. Um, and he's just, he's so essential to what they do. Devin Booker's that he may not be the leader, but he is, the best player on the Phoenix Suns and they're going to need him. Absolutely. I mean, I mean, we, we've been talking about that on the, on the past couple of pods. Like uh, it's pretty, it's pretty, it's pretty evident, pretty clear. Like how you said, Greg, that Suns are going to be able to handle the Pelicans, but if they want to make that serious championship run that, uh, that they were putting together a very good season uh, for, 
then they are going to absolutely need Devin yeah. Booker. And then just just real quick, you know, to kind of piggyback on on what you what you were talking about, Greg, is, uh, you know, the importance of Devin Booker. Uh, a lot of people around the league and uh, just a lot of people in the NBA community uh, were saying that Devin Booker can can't be that that one guy on the team. A lot of that, a lot of people saying Devin Booker um, isn't a, uh, uh, isn't a, a really that that much of an impactful player. You take Devin Booker off. That's what I'm saying. Right. That's what I'm saying. So big shot pod, man. Uh, hey, I hope my guy big shot pod is listening. I hopped on a podcast. Right. And I said Devin Booker is first team all NBA. And my guy didn't didn't agree with me. He said this is his argument. Look. This is his argument. His argument was when when D book was on the Suns without CB3 and this whole team, they were asked. That's why he was saying D book can't be the leading guy. And I feel like it's, this it's, it's it's almost like basketball as a team game. This this yeah. this needs to put this needs to put all those arguments to 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 death, man. These people always arguing to death, man. D book his has been showing his importance to to the to the Suns team. We've been seeing it all season. Uh, they were a dominant team first and practically everything and yeah. now D book goes down it becomes a series with the eight seed pelicans man i just want D book to get his respect man but jay talk to me a little bit about uh some other things you've been seeing about this series greg mentioned a lot of a lot of great things uh some key points yeah i mean if you put gold in a pile of shit it's, it's still going to be covered in shit i mean that's that's <laughs> that's kind of what De- devin booker w- was dealing with when he came into that horrible situation and in Phoenix, yeah man you and can then, put a lot of lipstick yeah. on a pig and it's still a pig <laughs> exactly i mean that that arguments yeah it's kind of irrelevant at that point but we're not going to dive deep into that it's it, it's obvious what devin booker means to this team um number one is leadership the, the the mentality he brings rubs off on the guys it's still there with cp3 as well but i mean they're there you can see they're so heavily relying on him offensively not as much defensively but just the character of what they're doing. So moving on, I agree with both of you. I think they're going to be able to get out of the series. Although the Pelicans have made it extremely taking them six. I did not expect. I expected a sweep here. I think as the may can't speak for the both. I 100% thought it was going to be a sweep. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so, but Pelicans Pelicans are a team on the rise, man. They're, they're going to be really good next season. And I'm excited. That's going to be, that's a, they're a fun team to watch too. Right. They all def- right. they defend their asses off. They move the ball, and then you're adding one of the most like electric, most exciting players in the league next season in Zion. Mm-hmm. Like man, that, that's, that's gonna be seen, that's gonna be a fun gonna be team, fun. man. Serious. Ab- absolutely, man. I feel like his team is gonna be fun, man. So we will be looking out for that uh, next year because probably over this year, man. So let's just yeah. uh, let's keep it pushing and let's get to the next series here. And uh, man, I'm this is why. We bought our guy Greg <laughs> on right here, man. You know, the, uh, Greg, we love you. We love having you on the pod, man. But we knew when the Utah Jazz were struggling like this, mm. and we were like, man, there's one man and one man only we need to go to. Greg Foster, Greg, the floor is yours. Whatever you want, man. Go ahead. The Utah Jazz stink. They're ass. And I hate them so much. They're the they are the worst vibes team in the league. Like they're, they they don't play a fun brand of basketball. It's not enjoyable. This, t- this team, like watching covering this team has been a complete suffer fest since January. And, you know, they started the season off. What was it? 20 and seven ended up 29 and 25 after the uh, announcement that Danny Ainge became the CEO of the Utah Jazz. I'm just saying, <laughs> just saying. Um, and, you know, when there, there's a lot of smoke, a lot of rumors going around there. And, you know, the saying like where there's smoke, there's fire. And if you watch this team play, it's apparent they don't like each other. This goes way beyond Donovan Mitchell, not passing the ball to Rudy Gobert. Um, there's also just like some very fundamental flaws when it comes to this roster. They're too old. They're too small. They're not athletic enough. And they don't have anybody who can guard at the point of attack. Their, their perimeter defense is probably the worst in the league. And it's been this way for years. And it, it becomes such a conundrum, such a, a, such a, a pick your poison when you go up against teams like the Clippers, like the Mavericks, like the Houston Rockets used to play when they can go five out 
And that is, do you bring Rudy out and have him guard in space, which I have no problem with. I think Rudy Gobert might be the Jazz's best perimeter defender. He can guard in space. This idea that like he can't guard the perimeter is very silly um, and, and it's just been perpetuated by like dumbass NBA Twitter. But the problem is, is that everybody out, <clears throat> then you have backdoor cuts and lanes to the basket all day. So do you give up layups or do you play drop coverage and give up wide open threes because nobody again can stay in front of their man. And it's just, again, it's roster construction. You've got, you've got no one. I mean, Mike Conley uh, is very washed as much as I love him. Donovan Mitchell's a turnstile. And Donovan Mitchell honestly hasn't been the same player since he hurt his ankle last season and came back early. Jeez. You can take you. You can see you, the lateral quickness isn't the same. The burst isn't the same. Um, and the effort's just not, not there. You see it from everyone. Like, this team has become so reliant on Rudy Gobert because he is such a generational-type defender that it's like uh, the perfect example was, what was it, game three or game four when uh, Spencer Dinwiddie catches the ball on the perimeter, does a quick little – little hezzy dribble and blows right past Donovan Mitchell, who doesn't give any sort of uh, any sort of effort, doesn't try to slow him down at all because he thinks Rudy's going to be right there in the paint. And he wasn't because Kleber was out there in the corner. Right. So, and then when it comes to, when it comes to offense, I really do got to, I, I got to, I got to call out Rudy Gobert for what it is. And that is for his entire career. He cannot exploit mismatches. He's very, very good at three things when it comes to offense. He's the best dunker finisher in the league. He sets incredible screens and he rebounds very well. Other than that, he can't do anything. And when you can put a six foot one Jalen Brunson on him in the paint, and he can't turn around and get a bucket that absolutely blows up the D or blows up the offense. Because then you're essentially playing four on five and you can trap guys like Donovan Mitchell and Mike Conley and Boyan on the perimeter. And it creates so much tension and so much, uh, so much dissonance that it just, it just doesn't work. And I, I, I go back and I retrace the steps of what this front office has done. Um, and there's been some real incredible fuck ups. You know, we saw back-to-back -back terrible playoff performances by Joe Ingles, but for some reason, they wouldn't move on from him. Even though there were all sorts of rumors about him being packaged for a deal with, you know, someone like Kaminga and Moody. And you look about that in, in hindsight, and it's like, I don't know, is J Jonathan Kaminga might be a better player than Joe Ingles at this point in their careers. And it, not only that, but like you can develop him, you know, um, Drafting Yudoka Azabuke, whose uh, uh, official signature shoe is a walking boot, uh, instead of someone like Jada McDaniels or uh, Desmond Bain, who were both on the Jazz's list, uh, mm -hmm. but apparently Des Dennis Lindsay panicked because you didn't have Rudy Gobert sign his big contract. And that's on top of bringing back Derek Favors. So, you know, like, there's just there's been these huge roster problems and like the, the the warts of this team have been apparent for for years and there's a blueprint to it and they didn't do enough this off season to to mitigate that you know the answers was to bring in Hassan Whiteside and Rudy Gay which still doesn't like give you the versatility that you need and Rudy Gay has been a 94 year old fucking water boy man. He, ain't seen he hasn't score. played a minute in like, yeah. so of course, like it's just, this team has become the definition of insanity mm -hmm. doing the same thing over and over expecting different results mm -hmm. and it doesn't work. And it's, it's, it's a top to bottom unmitigated failure from roster to coaching staff to, uh, to the front office. And this team needs to die. It's, it's not going to work. And it's, you're just, you're just jamming a square peg into a round hole right now. 
And if I'm, I don't know, like, it's obvious that the front office, Danny Ainge, Justin Zanuck, Ryan Smith, all the rest of them have their work cut out when it comes to uh, what to do this summer. If it were me, I would blow the entire thing up. I would trade Mike Conley. I would trade Rudy Gobert and I would trade Donovan Mitchell because you'd be able to get huge Paul George-esque hauls for both Donovan and Rudy. There are teams out there who would want both of them and would be able to give up a lot. And then you start over. You have a nice franchise with the players that you can get and you have, you know, three, four, five, six first round picks and you go in on player development and you realize that you cannot, you, you, you cannot construct a roster the way that you did. What will ultimately in the NBA works these days is you have to put the onus on two way wings and guys who can play both sides and who are versatile. Uh, and the jazz don't have that. So, you know, now what doesn't work. So maybe go all and do the opposite. And this isn't to say that like Mike and Rudy and Donovan aren't nice players. They're very, very good. Uh, But, you know, it's like, it's kind of like watching this team. It's like watching your parents fight, you know? And then like this series has kind of been like when your mom hands your dad, the divorce papers, you know? And it's like, yeah. And ultimately I see it as a good thing. We're being freed from this garbage ass basketball and there might be some optimism later. Like we might be the Kings or the Thunder for a few years. I don't care. I would rather watch that than watch Donovan Mitchell go seven for 21. I would rather watch players develop than not being able to see my eight year all NBA center do a drop step. Like I'm, I'm, I'm fully ready for this to be done. And again, I see it as a good thing. So RIP Bozos. Wow. 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 Greg, that was amazing. That was amazing. A beautiful way to, to describe the breakdown of this team. Um, I mean, just real quick, I guess. I, I, I mean, we have, I have a, we have a lot to talk about, a lot to say with the Jazz. But I guess <laughs> just real quick. Um, I mean, the last thing, you know, one of the last things that you kind of talked about there, um, being you want to see the, these guys done, you want to see this team blown up, deconstructed. So, um, you know, I and you don't have to, you know, go crazy, go crazy mm-hmm. in depth. But if you could give us what direction do you want to see? You know, do you want to see? Uh, Everyone gone. Do you want to see a uh, rebuild around a, a Donovan Mitchell? One thing I've been saying uh, all, all over to all my NBA hoop heads, why is Nikhil Alexander Walker just riding the bench? He is too good and too young to, to be sitting on that bench, not playing a minute. Uh, that's so like, do you want to like build around these young talents? Like, what is it that you know, I know you said you would blow up everything, but like, are you going to try to build around Donovan Mitchell or are you trying to build to the draft? Cause I don't know if a lot of people want to go to Utah. I would, I would like to, I would like to go and scrap the entire thing. Oh, wow. You know? And I think like, you know, you could get some nice pieces say of like, you know, you do a trade with New York for Donovan Mitchell and you get an RJ Barrett and an, you know, an Emmanuel quickly or, or something like that. Or you, you know, you trade Rudy Gobert to Atlanta and you get a John Collins and a DeAndre Hunter and a Clint Capella. That's like good. you can, and then, and then pick. So you like, you have solid players. You may not have your superstar, but you have solid players. And then you can kind of go through the draft and find the guys who can complement that. You find your star that way where you still remain competitive, but you have assets. That's the big problem with the jazz right now. The jazz are in basketball purgatory. They're a good enough team to win 45 to 50 games every year, make the playoffs as a four or five, six seed, lose in the first or second round, and then you don't have any draft capital, you don't have any assets that you can move, and you're just stuck in this perpetual cycle of mediocrity. So this is the way that you have to break that. Okay. Jay, talk to me, Jay. I know you got a lot to a lot of life feel about this series. Talk to me about how you feel. <laughs> I mean, originally I I had chosen the Jazz just because, well, it was allotted for the same reason. Like this was their last run, Greg, and I just felt that they knew this despite how much they, they, it was clear they didn't like each other. 
Quinn Snyder just – it's clear he wants to get out of there. I don't even feel like he's coaching to win games at this point, honestly. I, I, just, I think I think there's <clears throat> something with that. I think that you we're seeing some pretty major burnout. I also mm-hmm. think, like, he's just out of options. Like, mm-hmm. there's only so much you can do. You know, like, mm-hmm. I, I get what you mean about Nikhil Alexander-Walker, and I think it's frustrating. But if you – are relying on Nikhil Alexander Walker to win a playoff series. 100%. You're already fucked. A hundred percent. But although being said, I don't think that three DMPs deserve though, bro. Like no, we're talking no, about I to- no, I totally, I totally agree Pelicans. with that, especially with how bad Royce O'Neal has played in this series. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, the rigidity has been very, very frustrating. And some, sometime you got to just throw shit at a wall and hope it sticks. And like we're not seeing any of that. Hundred percent, Jay. Talk to us, Jay. What, what, what were you no, talking I mean, about the team? I mean, I don't have much to elaborate on what Greg's. I mean, I think just it's just too much of of the same of the same stuff. You, you've mm-hmm. had the, the same team for about what five? They've had that core for about five six years, minus Joe Ingles, who I, though I will say, Greg, and I don't know how you feel about this. I had said. From that point when he got injured, I remember the date. I just had written it down, noted January 30th, 2022, mm-hmm. when he blew out his knee. From that point on, a team who didn't like each other that much already, I felt, felt he was kind of the glue guy, if anything, kind of the glue that was holding him on. Yeah, he was falling he was, apart, but still a little bit. He was kind of their good vibes accountability mm-hmm. guy, but even right. that had kind of gone to the wayside because you can't be the accountability guy when you're scoring six points a game and shooting 20% for True. three. Valid. Like you can't, you can't be Joe Ingles and point the finger and be like, you got to step up guy. You're sucking shit. Mm-hmm. Like when you're having the worst season of your entire career. Mm-hmm. So it's just like, there's just been this, like this, this, this cavalcade. This, this is like cascade of bullshit, mm-hmm. you know? And I think, you know, you go back a few years in the jazz were the best defensive team in the league when they had Crowder and Rubio and kind of that iteration with, you know, young Donovan Mitchell and, and Rudy really kind of finding his stride as like this generational defender, but that team couldn't throw a rock in the ocean. Right. And so they blew that up and brought in a lot of offensive talent, Boyan and Mike, uh, and went the entire other direction now where all of their perimeter defenders can't guard their own shadow. <laughs> <laughs> it is and it was just bad. it was just like you got to find some sort of happy medium there and and that that didn't happen and that this team didn't make huge structural changes after that clipper series uh is it's kind of unbelievable in hindsight now that that you would expect this to like all of a sudden change it's like it's like the uh oh, who is it? The the owner or the yeah the old owner of the the Minnesota Timberwolves giving Andrew Wiggins that huge contract because he made him look him in the eye and promise he'd become a better defender. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Yeah, yeah, the jet. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, I fucking hate this team, and I really uh, am preying on their demise. There is one more thing though that I think is going to be interesting when it comes to this off season, and that is it wouldn't surprise me if one of the all stars stayed. Because the All-Star game is in Utah next year, Mm. and it would be very, very weird. And I don't think uh, Ryan Smith, the owner, would be super happy if there was no Utah Jazz representation there. Mm. So do you? Yeah, I don't know. So Dean Mitch is staying. Yeah, I I don't know. um, He's obviously the more popular guy. I think it Mm. would probably be easier to build around someone like Donovan Mitchell. Um, But... Again, like the front office has its work cut out for them. And uh, I do not envy Danny Ainge nor Justin Zanuck. Man, man, it is. It, it, they, they got some tough choices um, to make over there, man. But at, at least, at least, Greg, you know, I'm, I'm at least I'm one of those people that I like to look at the silver lining, you know, Greg. So at least I'll say this. At least you're not the Portland Trailblazers because the Portland Trailblazers were stuck in this pr- little purgatory island for like, 10 years so yeah man you no know, at least at least you guys are realizing it's not working and changing it and yeah. unfortunately i just think that like how you said greg um when when they run that five out lineup when the sh- big guys can shoot uh it's just over for the jazz because of that they are forced to play into that drop coverage and they kill them in the mid-range kill them by stretching the floor it's 
Yeah, because so, and so, it, yeah. it has everything to do with like, yeah, the Jazz cannot stay in front of anyone. Jalen mm-hmm. Brunson got his career high against this team. Chris Paul got his career high against that team. Uh, what was it? There was that back to back games where Jamal Murray had ninety three points and zero turnovers. Like it just continues to happen, and you don't need any more evidence. And it's just it's it's fucking stupid. Yeah. Oh, so, All right, Greg, Greg, they're getting closed out in in six. Oh yeah, yeah it's over. It's over. losing out. Yeah. Again, I'm Man. I'm wearing nothing but black, and I I'm really I'm really at the point. I just want the Mavericks to put this team out of its misery. Okay. Yeah, like it Man. it it needs to end. We're at the point where it's like your boy is dating like an abusive girlfriend and you got to just tell him like, you got to, you got to leave, man. It might suck for a minute, but like you got to think long-term yeah. Yeah. man. All right. All right, Greg. Hey, well, we, <laughs> we love, we love your, your two cents on the jazz and and we got you and heard you. And maybe I'll clip that, send that to Dwayne Wade, Ryan Smith and all, all the jazz or, uh, owners organization. Maybe they'll make some changes, man. I will say this, like, the Mavericks are good and I like them. Um, and Luca's a superstar and Brunson's going to get uh, a hell of a lot of money in this off season. Um, hey. and hats off to them. They absolutely won that trade. And Porzingis is a fucking bozo and I'm glad he gets to go rot in Washington. Man, Porzingis was doing nothing for that, for, for that, uh, that map scene. We see Dwight Powell, Maxi Kleeb out there doing the, t- taking, taking advantage of that, generational point guard in Luca, man. So yeah, shout out the shout out the Mavericks, man. Doing yeah, man. Doing big things, man. But all right. So then let's keep it pushing. Jay, let's get to your series, man. That Warriors versus Nuggets. Uh Warriors the, well right now it's uh a, um April 27th. We got the we got the Warriors and Nuggets game later tonight. Um pretty sure the Warriors are gonna put them out here in this game. Um got like a got like an 80% feeling they're gonna put them out like a 20% feeling Jokic has another ridiculous game and maybe the Nuggets are able to snag with snatch on man. But since it's uh since this game is in chase center, the Warriors are a good home team. Um, you know, I'm, I'm leaning on a 80%, uh, no, the Nuggets don't get it. And 20% the Nuggets get, uh, get this game. But uh, un- if anything, man, this series is over. War- Warriors need to wrap this up and uh, get ready for this next round, man. Curry off the minutes restriction, but Jay, talk to me. Yeah, this this series uh, should be closed out tonight. I'm to to your eighty percent. I'm almost ninety five percent. I don't expect another twenty four point seven for eleven five for seven um, game from Monte Morris, especially on the road. Jokic is going to do what he does, and this series that's pretty much kept them afloat despite other guys not stepping up. I also don't expect 21 from, from Aaron Gordon. And then the, the bench um, production of Bones Highland. We saw what he did breaking out for, for that little hot streak he had in the first half. And then Boogie Cousins, you know what the old adage is, role, role players don't play as well on the road. I think it's a closeout game for, for the Warriors. And I just believe they're going to have that focus from the start. I feel like they came out a little sluggish in game four kind of took it for granted like they were going to just come out there and and Denver was just going to roll over and 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 win that game but yeah ex- I expect to close out here at Chase and and look forward to uh to either the winner of Minnesota and Memphis Greg you got any words Too much on this series? Uh I think the Warriors are really good. I think it's great that you know the back-to-back MVP finally won a playoff game. <laughs> <laughs> um nah right. but this series has kind of gone how we all thought it was going to. And I think that, uh, bar, you know, if Devin Booker can't come, come back healthy, I expect the Warriors to be in the finals. They look like a very finely tuned machine. Like you're not going to be able to win every single game, but they look, they look so solid. Steph is still continuing to like get his, you know, get his rhythm back and like having him as a sixth man. Are you kidding me? Man. <laughs> like, right, you've, got, you've got one of the top right. 10 top 10 best players in the history Scary. of the league as as a six man and like yeah i expect it to uh right i expect it to be over uh a really fun wrinkle in this series is the emergence of jordan Poole. like how he wasn't in the most improved still blows my mind man. he's so he's become so good and so like 
he's just one of those dudes who's just built for the moment. Mm-hmm. And I love that. Uh, that new, that new death lineup they have is yeah. It's just fun. Uh, I love the way the warriors play basketball. Um, and yeah, I think it's, I think this series was kind of over before it started and totally. yeah, I expect it to be a four, one gentleman sweep after tonight. Greg, Greg, yeah. real quick on that note, um, before you, before you go on John, um, what talk to me about the MIP. I know that obviously Ja won. he had a huge dr- a leap from his, um, yeah. his, his, his last year to, to now, like there's no debating the stats, but for me personally, when I look at most improved player, I just look at a second pick. Brandon Ingram, I know, won it two years, two years before that. And I look at mm-hmm. like a top three pick. I just don't I think that pr- improvement should be expected. Like you're a top three pick going into the league. Yeah. And I'm not taking it anyway. Ja had a huge improvement. If if you're going by that, like most improve, he did improve, but I shouldn't think that should be expected. Like a player who's not expected to make that leap, the Desmond Baines the yeah. um jordan pools the um even throw in darius garland maybe Dejounte murray they're still higher picks but those kind of late round guys i think should be more yeah. more more they should get that nod over a, a top five yeah. pick or a top 10 pick in my opinion but how you feel about that i think that uh it's it's more impressive and a little bit uh more surprising that a Jordan Poole can go from like a, you know, like mid tier starter, almost like bench guy to G being League a guy. Player. Yeah. G league player. And then going yeah. from uh, going to a guy who's scoring 20 plus points a game and carrying a team uh, that's been, that was hamstrung by injuries throughout the entire season. And I think what he did was really impressive. Um, and I think again, like you know, someone like DeJounte Murray, who's out, who's been like a really nice player. You're like, mm-hmm. oh, this guy is kind of on the cusp of something and then really kind of exploding and, you know, becoming a triple double guy, becoming an all star. I think stuff like that is is a little less expected than someone like Jaw going from a star to a superstar. Mm-hmm. And again, that's not a knock. Jaw might be my favorite player in the league. Um, mm-hmm. But I guess it's just I think it's it's expectations based, you know, right. And ultimately, like, yeah, I don't really have a problem if Jaw wins most improved. That's mm-hmm. fine. Me I just neither, like I just like to see guys get credit when it's deserved. And I think mm-hmm. that like the jump that Jordan Poole made was really impressive. Yeah. I'm I'm right there. And I, he's gonna be he's gonna be great playing for the Jazz next year when you guys trade for Rudy Gobert. <laughs> no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna love him. Sir. No, sir. Hey, Greg, keep that's him hilarious, up. man. <laughs> man, hey, Jay, I love I, I love the fact that you bring that up, man. Because yeah, I, I uh, a lot of people in the NBA community mm-hmm. are right there with you. John Moran was expected to have a. Um, a jump mm-hmm. again, you know, no knock, but expected to jump players like, uh, like pool, like Bain, um, even like how you said, even as far as Garland, not expected to, uh, be carrying, um, uh, be carrying their team, uh, later, later in the playoffs, man. So yeah, absolutely right there with you, Jay. So man, guys, let's keep it pushing and let's get to this next series. This is on the low to be rude to you guys, a real sleeper series, like could be one of the best series. Uh, we said we, we said this over here on the pod when we did the previews for the playoffs, like this realistically might be besides that Nets and Celtics series, which we'll talk about uh, is a really is a really good series, man. Because look, guys, honestly, with you, I was thinking upset uh, the Wolves being such a, a team built for the playoffs. I mean, I've talked about it so many times, having that semi big three players that actually complement each other. Amazing defense. Uh, the Grizzlies got out of all these teams really in the first round, got the least experience of all these teams. But uh, so that's why I was thinking upset, man. But what's what's happening right now is the Wolves inexperience is coming out, man. I mean, we're seeing silly turnovers. We're seeing them getting in foul trouble. Co- uh, Coach Finch doing absolutely nothing about it. They panic when they go down. Extremely inconsistent. I mean, I, I talked about this on the on, on the last pod, and I just think this stat is just ridiculous. So I, I need to run it back, man. In that in that game three, the Minnesota Timberwolves and their scoring. First quarter had 39 points, second quarter, 12 points, third quarter, 32, fourth quarter, 12. 
I think it's just the the amount of inconsistency is just is just showing out, man. While team while the other team like the Grizzlies been just so steady, so consistent. I mean, how many times have we seen them go down big? We've seen that twenty six point comeback. They understand it's a game of runs, and their consistency is just keeping them alive. John Morant emerging as the best player. Jay, you say this all the time on the pod. You say sometimes the best player just emerges and just comes out and takes over the series, and that's really what happened last night. Ja having 16 points in six minutes. Um, it's just ridiculous, man. Uh, shout I love out him so much. Shout out the Grizzlies. Shout out the Grizzlies, man. I mean, I, hey, if you guys are on YouTube, you guys see what I'm wearing, man. I'm rocking <laughs> this clean jaw jersey because this, this performance that he had last night was insane. So, guys, I don't know if you guys want to touch a little bit on the game, on the series. Uh, how are you guys feeling? Go ahead, Jay. I said at top of the show, man. I, I, ja did his thing. Ja did his thing. Memphis came back storming, but I just don't understand how you could have that defensive breakdown at the end of the game and a guy jumping out on the pass 30 feet from the basket. You let him catch it going away from the basket. I mean, and then make, make let him make a shot, let him hit a 30 footer, or let him, let him take a three. I just don't understand. Ja wants to get down the lane. He wants to finish. We know he can finish with the best of him. And we saw it. And put Malik Beasley, like, oh, my goodness. Um, (laughs) R.I.P. Gross, man. Nuts in the face and everything. Dude, the the Ian Eagle call, too, is still, like, for him to just, like, come out and just say a a jawbreaker, like, are you (laughs) kidding me? So good. (laughs) Facts, facts. I'm going to say that Ian Eagle had the best season out of anyone on the Nets. (laughs) Ooh. Ooh, he went there. He went there. But. But yeah, no, nothing much to say. Uh, Jaron Jackson, if he's going to continue to play 17 minutes and get in foul trouble every single game, the Grizzlies have no chance of, of moving past this round. Maybe even this round. Honestly, they're not out of the water. Let's, they got to go back to Minnesota. They're in Minnesota now. Shout out, Kat. But um, I just think, no, they're, they're in trouble if he stays. He continues to get himself in foul trouble. And, and that was probably the hole they were in because he couldn't stay on the floor. He's their be- all-NBA all defender, but can't stay on the floor. So... Um, those are my initial shots, thoughts in that game. But, Greg, I don't know if you want to talk more about the game. Yeah, I think, you know, watching the Grizzlies last year play the Jazz, uh, it's very apparent that this is a team that just does not quit. Mm-hmm. You know, and they put that constant pressure on you. Like, they they play basketball the way that Ricky Hatton used to fight, where it's just, like, constantly in your face. And, like, yeah, you might get knocked out every now and again, but, like, you're always going to have that constant pressure and it wears down. And I think we're also seeing uh, a little bit of a, a difference, a discrepancy in experience. The Grizzlies have been here before, and you know they know they they know how the playoffs go. Um, and I think sometimes the moment's been a bit big for the uh, the Minnesota Timberwolves, and they're still learning and ironing things out. And I think that was very apparent in the fourth quarter last, you know, last game and blowing the big 26 point lead. Um, and yeah. And then the emergence, of course, of jaw, just being the best player in this series. And, you know, that's a really nice thing to be able to have that ACE up your sleeve and just be able to throw your superstar the ball and be like, Hey, uh, we need you to go win this game for us. Mm-hmm. And jaws proven. He can do that. Like guys, a bona fide superstar, like, right on the cusp of being a top 10 player in this league. He's awesome. Um, So I do expect I, I, the Grizzlies are going to win this series and then it's going to be, it's going to be a dog fight against the Warriors in the next round. And that's a series that I have like circled on my calendar, but you're right. If triple J can't stay on the floor, that that's going to, that's going to ruin things. I did see a stat that like he has to play the four, because for some reason, when Steven Adams is on the court, he fouls at a much lower rate. But does that work against that death lineup of the uh, the Warriors? So it's it's going to be an interesting chess game. Um, and I don't know. I'm really excited for it. Man, all right, all right. So yeah, so that 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 mm-hmm. definitely is one of those uh, those sleeper series. So stay tuned for that. I, that's one that I don't think it's over until it's really over until the final bell goes through. Man, so. All right, so then let's keep it pushing, guys, and let's get to the next series, uh, <laughs> the Miami Heat versus the Atlanta Hawks. Man, oh, man. I just think that, unfortunately, this was just a bad matchup for the Hawks and, and Trey Young, especially, you know, not having Clint Capella, having John Collins uh, bat- battling two injuries. 
Um, it honestly seemed like the Miami Heat were like schoolyard bullies out there against Trey Young. Like, it, like it really seemed like that to me. Like, I don't know if if you guys felt felt me on that, but I just felt like every time Trey Young got the ball, whether it was um, on the other side of the court because he was taking the ball out uh, out of bounds, or whether he was off a of pick and roll, he was feeling somebody in his jersey getting blitz consistently, man. And just with the size that that, that the Miami Heat have with uh, PJ Tucker. Uh, Butler, Larry, Max Strews, just they can throw so many different bodies and so many different looks. Bam. All these players who can stay with him. Jimmy. Even for- J- Jimmy, I always first stay with them in the perimeter. Like, man, I just think that unfortunately the Hawks ran into the worst possible matchup they could have ran into uh, for the for, for this first um, first round. He took care of it. Uh, guys, I don't know if you guys have any thoughts on the series. I do have some questions I want to talk to you guys about, but I want to get your thoughts first. I, I mean, think- yeah. yeah, go ahead, Jay. No, mine, mine's quick, G. Mine's quick. Uh, I knew the series was over, not just when Jimmy and, and Kyle Lowry, they sat him out. I was just like, that was a slap to slap in the face of the Hawks, man. I, I think they could have, they were able to play, to be honest. Like, I don't know what the official, I, I think they could have played through it if they really, it was, the series was on the line, but I think they just knew they had it in control. I don't really have much else to add other than that. I'm, he really dominated this series. I think the Atlanta Hawks are the Utah Jazz East. <laughs> and I think it's a team that needs to just, I think it's another team that like needs to be blown up. Uh, I know a lot of it win. has to do with injuries, yeah. but I, I don't think that it works. Um, and on the other side of the, of the coin, like it would not surprise me if we see the Miami heat in the finals again, they're so deep. They're so complete. And they, I love the way they play too. They share the ball, they move it like crazy, and they defend their asses off. That defense, like they just grind teams down to a fine powder throughout the entire game, you know. And you've got an all defensive guy in Bam Adebayo, you know, playoff Jimmy's a top 10 player in this league. He's so like just another guy who's just built for the moment, just, you know, Mr. Locked in. Um, Kyle Lowry is a first ballot hall of famer. Like, and then you've got just complimentary guys. Tyler hero is going to be the, the six man of the year. Duncan Robinson's had a great series. PJ Tucker at 65 years old can still guard <laughs> one through five. And like, is able to play that brand of bully ball. There were a couple times, I think what was it in game game four or either game four or game five, they just threw him the ball on the block and just had him go to work. Even at that age, like they're just, they're just a nasty team, and I really like them. They're just, yeah, again, deep, totally complete, like have have their guys, you know, and then, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I, all I have are, are good things to say about Miami. Um, I really want them to, to end up playing either the Celtics or the Bucks and just get like one of those old-fashioned, just like nasty Eastern Conference series that we used to get mm-hmm. in like the the – late 90s so you want to mm. score like like 70 to 80 or something like that <laughs> <laughs> just i mean we'll get we'll get more than that but like just that that nastiness mm-hmm. like the team the the miami heat are a nasty team mm-hmm. you know they are they they take pleasure in beating teams up mm-hmm. and i love that about them oh yeah yeah you're, you're right they are just they are just bullies, they but they dirty. revel in in being the bully. And, you know, like, if you don't want to be bullied, then bully someone back. And Atlanta wasn't mm-hmm. able to do that. Absolutely, man. Honestly, and 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 that's exactly where what I want to talk to you guys about with. And, uh, I mean, I know it's over for the Hawks, and we definitely got some offseason coverage coming on during offseason. But just real quick, I just want to talk to you guys about uh, Trey Young. You know, Jay, big lover, big uh, big, big Trey Young guy. Uh, he believes in Trey Young a lot. I definitely um, definitely like Trey Young. Uh, good good guy. Um, I just think that. Sometimes he's oh, over tunnel vision, overly shoots, shoots a little bit too much, uh, doesn't really take care of the ball uh, the greatest. But and and I sometimes have a hard time putting him in that. You know, last last episode we talked about it, Jay. We, you know, we talked about it with Jenny. We talked about if Trey Young's in that superstar category, and I 
have a really hard time putting him there. I wouldn't put him there. Uh, like I'm talking that Luca, that Luca category, right? Yeah, exactly. I wouldn't have. He's but he's I, right out. He's knocking on the door. Like he's right. Luca. Okay. I mean, trade is best. Trade last year in the playoffs, mm-hmm. right there. Um, but I think he's also a guy that like needs to have talent around him. You know, again, it's yeah. a team game, and like when you don't have Capella, you don't have a healthy John Collins. You've got a seventy-four-year-old Gallinari trotting out there. Like they just they didn't. It's it's hard to to be at maximum efficiency and effectiveness when you don't have your horses, especially when you're a point guard. And I I think part of like his his trigger happiness in this series was was a little bit out of panic, like because he couldn't rely on other guys. So it's kind of like. You know, he kind of did the same thing that like you've seen Russ do or like really what Donovan Mitchell has done this entire year where it's like, you know, I'm 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 the guy and nobody else is going to do it. So I got to do it. And I don't think that's necessarily the right way to play basketball. But, you know, when you run out of options, sometimes that's what happens, man. And 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 that's exactly honestly where. Where, where, where I was going to and I was going to allude to was, uh, you know, Trey, I'm just being a little a little too trigger happy in this in the in this series. And I I do agree. And I although I do agree with that point, Greg, that you bring up of, you know, him being under man, not having his guys there. But I feel like in in that pers- in that moment, you know, that's when you really need to step up. That's when you really need to be there. And I don't I just don't feel like he did that in this series, man. And not only was it it was a bad matchup for him, but he way underperformed. I mean, in this last game. This game five, winner go home. Eleven points on two of sixteen from from the field. O of five from the three. Seven yeah. turnovers, and it's not just this game, right? And I feel like if he would have been the regular Trey Young, even Trey Young that we seen last year, the Hawks could have pulled off that game that Bogdanovich went off. But if Trey Young didn't wasn't the regular train that we know of that game that DeAndre Hunter went off. I think that the Hawks could have pulled that game off if Trey Young was at his regular self and his, uh-huh. his scoring capabilities, but he just, honestly, to me, I mean, I'm not going to call him overrated, but this, I think this series really put like a big stamp on like, man, like this is how you stop this kid. Like, cause he, yeah. I mean, he, he was, he, he was coming out here last year and not a lot of people had a lot of answers for him. Um, uh, in, in, uh, I didn't have him beating the, the 76ers. Jay, Jay had him in the 76ers last year. Uh, I didn't even, didn't even have him taking it to the bucks and, you know, they were able to do it, uh, do their thing. But I just think that this year, the Miami, he really proved like, man, this is how you stop a player like uh, Trey Young. You just put the pressure on him. You just bully him out there, man. Yeah. Yeah. For Trey, yeah, for, Trey for him to, to exceed and get better, he has to move. He has to play more so off ball, just like Stephen Curry. He He's one of the best to do it. But if he's his willingness to not play off ball is puts him in like sticky situations. You Mm -hmm. just throw doubles at him. You be physical with him on the ball and he's not willing to cut and move without the ball. I think it's really hard, especially at his small, like his, he's smaller than a lot of guys. He's probably one of the smaller guards. He's listed at what? Six, one, six, two. I don't even know if he's that, but still, and he's got a frail frame. Exactly. So if he's not willing to move off ball, it's going to be hard for him to be um, successful or, or reach his true potential. Um, and that's a lot what you saw this series. So, man. All right. All right. Well, hey, we're looking forward for the Hawks. Uh, let's see what they do in the offseason. But for now, let's uh, let's move on and let's have the heat face. Um, uh, let's have the heat move on and face the winner of this next series, man. And let's talk about Toronto and the 76ers. Jay, you're over there in Toronto. You are our uh Canada's ambassador for our for clutch talk over here. Jay, so to talk to so Jay, talk to us about this series. Is are the rappers gonna come back on this thing, man? Definitely an X back here, not a not a Toronto native, but uh, I will say that raps in seven. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Listen, if anybody, and- if anybody can blow a 3-0 lead, it's Doc Rivers. <laughs> it's Doc Rivers. And I, but but here's why, here's why I say that. Number one. I think it's a lot, a lot, you know, I, I love Frederico Van Vliet. No, well, no doubt about that. But I think that they, they've they been looking like a better team. I think a lot of this was to do with, you've seen the last two games, number one, after he was injured, the Raptors looked, number one, I was talking to John about this yesterday. They could switch one through five. 
Fred gives up a lot of size. And number one, when he's not fully healthy and he can't move laterally, he's kind of a he's kind of a liability on, on deep defensively. And then when you look at on the offensive end, sometimes he has he can force a lot of shots um, when when he can't and when he's not hitting. Um, it's not good. So what he's he's a negative on the floor. And then you insert Scotty Barnes, a healthy Scotty Barnes into that lineup for the for the Raptors defensively. That's that's nightmares for Philly. They're looking for match m- matchups. They're trying to get switches. They're setting ball screens and there's none. You one through five can switch on to whoever they had and add to the fact that Joel Embiid has a, 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 a torn ligament in his thumb on his shooting hand. It's just mm-hmm. bad. It's just bad. And then add in the fact Matisse Tybel can't play into it, play in, uh, in Toronto. Toronto. What a, what a it's going seven and anything can dummy. happen in a game seven. So man, I, that's all I really can say. I, I think Raptors are going to get it done in, in Toronto. So, yeah, wow. we, and you know, and if, if, anyone can find James Harden. Uh, we're about to put his face on a milk carton. For real, huh? Philly, Philly's getting the full James Harden uh, playoff experience, bro. Yeah. You know, um, I really hope I'm a Philly guy. Philly's my second home. Mm-hmm. I, but it's, I don't know, like it's going to take a big Herculean effort and, yeah, it wouldn't surprise me if it goes seven. And again, mm-hmm. like if anybody can blow a uh, a three zero lead, it's Doc Rivers. He stinks. Man, yeah. I, he's gonna I be he's you. gonna be great for the Lakers next year. Oh, oh no! Oh no! I don't think Doc oh. wants that, and I don't think the Lakers want that. I, <laughs> I think it's a two way two a two way no. <laughs> oh man, oh, man. But, look. Um, but yeah, I'm pulling for my boys. I, I'd like to see Philly. Uh, pull it out, but you know, I also like Toronto. Toronto's, I'm just all in on good vibes right now. Mm-hmm. You know, that's all I care about at this point because mm-hmm. I've suffered through the worst vibe season of all time. <laughs> um, and Toronto's a good vibes team. I like the way they play. You know, didn't think that Scotty Barnes would be the player he is. He's he's fantastic. The re the resurgence of Pascal Siakam has been a really fun development. I really like Pascal, you know, Mm. and I don't think we can say enough about how good of a coach Nick nurse is. Man. Absolutely. Nick nurse has been definitely. I love the guy. He's, he's fabulous. Absolutely. Absolutely. Man. Nick nurse, Nick, Nick nurse, Nick nurse was the the game changer for, uh, for, for the Raptors. As soon as, as soon as he came, Doc Doc Rivers is getting out coached. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. And then, and then the uh, only thing I really want to add on this series to be real is, um, and, and I, I know this might sound crazy because it's like, man, John, like relax, Joel Embiid is injured, but Joel Embiid really is kind of letting me down the way he's playing with this, um, with this torn ligament. And I'm not saying it's easy to play with the injury at all, but I think when you're a certain star caliber, caliber of a player, you need to just be able to figure it out, man, be able to play, uh, play through some of these things. And this, this, this thumb injury is, very, very much disappointing him. Uh, in game five, the Raptors had 56 points in the paint uh, to versus the uh, versus the 76ers, 36. The Raptors out rebounded the 76ers. I think yeah. all of these things should not be happening when you have a Joel Embiid. I mean, in the preview of this series, we talked about Joel Embiid should be feasting in the paint. There is not a single soul probably in the arena that can that can get get even close to guarding uh, guarding him down low. He's just too big, uh, overweight, overbearing, and hardened. I mean, <clears throat> Greg, you said it, man. Let's put this guy's face on every milk card and let's put out an Amber Alert because this is not <laughs> the same Harden that we've seen, man. Dude, oh, guys, we remember, remember Harden being a three-time scoring champion, right? He's yeah. only scored more than 20 points in games one and four. Every other game, he scored less than 20 yeah. points. Like, this is not the same James Harden. And when them Embiid is out, what do you do as a second player? You step up. Bo- yeah. Bo Bong Bogdanovich, man. I don't even know if I'm saying his name right, but the guy on the Hawks. Bogdanovich, man. When Trey Young wasn't there, what did he do? He stepped up. He and stepped up, yeah. And I think Harden's not I doing think that, man. That's, that's kind of ubiquitous for the entire Sixers roster. Like, your big man isn't right. You got you know that going in. Your boy needs some help. Bing rebounds. You got to, you mm-hmm. know, like – get the ball to other guys and hit shots. Like you can't, I know that Embiid is a generational talent and was my pick for the MVP this season. Like just fabulous. (laughs) Love Joel Embiid, but like 
when he's not right, other guys need to step up. And that's why they built this roster the way that they did. That's why they dealt Ben Simmons, you know, like Mm -hmm. Tobias Harris is committing uh, like just bank robbery right now. Like, guys, (laughs) come on, man, like earn those checks. I want to see it, but um, yeah, it's going to be, it's going to be really interesting. I will say this, that if Philadelphia does not close them out in the game six, I'm all in on the Raptors winning a game seven. Wow. Wow. You, I'm yeah, all look, in. Cause I'll I think be, by, by then, like you've got spirits that are just down the toilet and yeah, not looking good. I look, I'll be real open and honest. I still have, mm-hmm. I still have 76ers only because um, I I'm still, I'm still a believer of the best player in the series is going to yeah. end up emerging. And that being, and that being Joel Embiid, uh, Jay, you talk about in the preview, the importance of the second, the second best player in the series. And that's clearly not Ben James Harden. Um, so, so, so that, 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 that could be a point for the Raptors, but another thing I just can't, um, rely on is the Raptors consistently shooting well uh, they, they haven't been able to do that really all season and that's a big vital part of their game in beating a in beating a team like a 76 especially mm-hmm. with Joel out there man so I, I'll, I'll I'll go I'll go I'll go uh, 76ers think that, I think they should be able to take care of it in six man but if they don't um, it, it'll definitely end up going down to seven game series but I think the best player is ultimately gonna Gonna mm-hmm. pull this one out. Um, so let's let's keep it pushing, guys. If you guys don't have nothing to add to that series, and let's get to this uh Bucks versus Bull series. Um, it's, I mean, over. It's, it's over, it's over, it's over. <laughs> it's yeah, over. not the mo- yeah. next, it's, next, please. It's, yeah, it's over. Yeah, Levine's out, yeah. it's over. But bu- bu- yeah. uh, Bulls need to get big, messed yeah. up the trade. Gian- Giannis is the best player in the league, hands down. Mm. Yeah, it, it's he's over. Top yeah. Two. I- he's top two, and he's not two. <laughs> I love it, I love it. Look, I love it. Uh, I feel bad for I feel bad for the Bulls. I really wish that Lonzo was healthy. I think that he would help a lot in this series, but ultimately mm-hmm. they just they don't have the guys um and mm-hmm. size. They they need they need somebody. They need some sort of interior defense, man. Like yeah. Vooch Vooch is Vooch is a sieve. Yeah. <laughs> Vooch, my boy Vooch. <laughs> I like and getting, I like Vooch. I think he's I think he's a really talented player. He's a he's a yeah. two-time yeah, he's a two-time all-star for a reason. But he's not. He's not who the. Mm-hmm. I, he's not who the Bulls need. He's not. He, I don't really think he fits the mold of that team. And I would be. I, I would be shocked if Chicago doesn't try to deal him. Go and try to get a Miles Turner. <laughs> Shit. Go try to get a Rudy Gobert. I don't know. Will be interesting to see. It's gonna. I, I don't know. I'm. I'm very excited for this summer. Absolutely. I mean, we we, we know that the Bucks are gonna end up facing. Basically the Celtics. So it's honestly looks that's let's, gonna be such a that's gonna be such a fun series, man. That's mm. gonna be a, such a fun series. I guys. we'll we'll talk about it in the next uh yeah. I mean I have the I, next I, recap. I ha- look, I have to be real with you, nothing to add on this Bulls series. Uh it's over for the Bulls. They should have got some size. Um, Greg, I hear you. Uh I I, I feel bad for the Bulls. Jay, you, you got anything to suck, you, man. You got anything nah, to add about that? Been saying the same, same story. We about talked about this like yeah. months ago when I came in the pod yeah. that they needed like size being, and they needed yeah. somebody to be able to protect the paint and it didn't happen. And again, uh, my policy for all of this is sucks to suck. Yeah. Reap what you sell. A hundred percent. Yeah. hundred percent. All right, guys. So then let's get to the biggest series of all. I mean, I, 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 <laughs> I, I honestly with you oh, have man. been waiting to just sound off. Um, I'm just, just, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna. They I'm stink. Gonna, I just, they stink, in. dog. Go Look, in. honestly, Jay, thank you, Jay. Look, honestly, I'm not even gonna talk real quick. I, I'm not even gonna touch on the game. I need to talk real quick about Ben Simmons. I have to talk thing, about brother. Ben Simmons. Do your thing, dog. Bro. Listen, I get have him to, a fucking oh blanket and a binky. Get him, get him out of here, dog. Like this guy genuinely pisses me off. He dog. does. Uh, I, I honestly don't think hating. he likes play. I, I don't think he I, likes playing. I don't basketball. think he. I don't think he likes play. I have been hating this guy. I mean. Since, since 2016, he came to the NBA. Look, he got drafted, and then he got drafted to the 76ers. And I thought to myself, why in the 
for fudge do you pair up Joel Embiid and, and, and Ben Simmons? Ben Simmons, who cannot shoot in a pick and roll league where you set high pick and rolls and you're just going to double Joel Embiid. Why are they on the same team? And then the 76ers started this, oh, Joel Embiid is a point guard thing. And they forced that upon him. No, Joel, I'm Joel, sorry, not Joel Embiid, Ben Simmons. They said Ben Simmons is a point guard. He's not a damn point guard. He, yes, he can pass the ball. Let him be a four that can stretch the floor. Stop, let, stop having him be this point guard. Look, guys, and then he doesn't he, he cries his way out of Philly for what? Again, like uh, the way I look at it is like, what, what are the Philly fans asking you to do? Shoot the ball, get in the gym. You're a damn basketball player. Do it. So he cries his way out of Philly. The reports come out. He says he's going to play in, 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 in a game for, you know, fucking win or go home. I don't even like to cuss, guys. Like, I like to keep myself more. You really don't. Calm, bro, really don't. like, I, I don't even want to cuss. And then this guy doesn't play in a game, win or go home. This guy doesn't play because of back pains. But guess what? In game three, when he was out there looking like a damn goofy in that little tracksuit, whatever the heck he was wearing, he was walking around with that chain, no back pain. And and honestly, at this point, Greg, I'm just like how you said, does this guy even like basketball? Like, what the Oh my God. I just, uh, guys, go ahead and talk about him because I, I, oh my God, I just hate Ben Simmons. I hate Ben Simmons. What, what else? I mean, honestly, what else could, uh, what else can be said? <laughs> oh, but like, I, like it, like D- Jay, D- you said it best. Right? Is his mental health contributing to the, this guy's back pain? Like, no, what the, that what? was a report that actually came out. Like, Are you that, serious? That was, that's, that's a report that actually came <laughs> out. Sham Sh- Sharnia, Sharnia, who's, close has been in close contact with the clutch the clutch um sports came out and said that was they met with uh his team met with um senior executives with brooklyn and they said his his mental health was contributing to his back pain my god that's what he said that's i I, you can't make this up that that's what he said and i don't i don't i I don't know what to say to that i don't want to make i definitely don't want to make light of mental health struggles exactly Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think it's, you know, there's a, there's a, mm-hmm. a fine line there, mm-hmm. but, um, uh, and granted I'm no doctor and, you know, mm-hmm. I didn't do great in anatomy or, and, and physiology, but there seems to be a bit of a disconnect there. And like, you know, it seemed like his back and his brain were fine when he had the cameras on them telling him, you know, telling them to, to watch this when he dunks in practice. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I, I mean, I just, again, I don't want to make light of of mental health reasons, but I also don't like people using that as a crutch. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, the guy, um, you know, Sarah, my co-host was worked for the Philadelphia Inquirer and was, was in Philadelphia covering Ben Simmons. And she'll be the first to tell you that like, this is a, this is a kid who's been coddled his entire life, you know? And when things get tough, he quits. He quit on his team in L- at LSU. He quit on his team in high school. He quit on the Philadelphia 76ers. Like, this is not a man with a lot of resolve. Man. Um, and do I know that, like, Ben Simmons would have changed the outcome of this series? I don't know. Probably not. Uh, you know, and may have been a detriment. Like, a guy who hasn't played basketball for a year coming into a uh, – uh, a playoff series against a team that's red hot. I don't know, but you got to try something, man. Like you've got to at least have some sort of solidarity with your teammates. Um, and then like just the roster construction of this Nets team, man. Mm-hmm. Like, I know you, you, I mean, they're just, they're so top heavy and it's just such a mess. And then, you know, you shift the, you shift the, uh, the focus on Kyrie and hearing him talk about like how the, how the net set up multiple vaccination uh, appointments for him. And he just didn't show up, you know, and then talked about like how he felt he let his team down and couldn't be there for his guys. And like, it's just at this point, it's just like, shut the fuck up, dude. Shut up Kyrie. Shut the like, man. Oh my God. You're just, you're like Kyrie Irving is a contrarian for the sake of being a contrarian. Man. Like the type of guy who likes the smell of his own farts. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and just to, 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 to see his actions and his words and just how incongruent it is. 
like, of course you're going to cause drama and there's not going to be the, the chemistry and the, the synchronicity that you want when you miss the majority of the season, <laughs> man, to try to make some sort of like, what, what point are you trying to make that you are like, that you are the voice of the working man? I, and then, like, uh, yeah, and then and then a video comes out of you fucking in the club dancing. Like yeah. that's what I'm saying. That's it, what I'm like. He has. Sorry, Jay. Go ahead, Jay. Go ahead, Jay. No, and the sad part about all of this, um, unfortunately, it's either Kyrie who, who's going to go, which I don't see them giving up because they're not going to get anything back. They're just capped out. They're not going to get anything back. Or ultimately, Steve Nash. I think they're going to have to get rid of one of the two. And it's uh, it's it sucks for Steve Nash. I mean, there was nothing. He was handicapped from the beginning. Um, number one, K- K- KD coming back from his Achilles injury. Um, that was already a thing. And then you look at Kyrie not even playing. I believe they've only played in, I think, 200 something games or 100 something of the possible games. They've only played. Got the number for you, Jay. Right how here. many? How many is it? He's he, he since he's been on the on the Nets. There's been 246 games. He's played 103. Yeah, right. like no fucking ridiculous. Of, of, How many of those? Of course, there are going to be together. problems. Oh, okay. No, yeah. I, I, I would that 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 one's yeah. just Kyrie. That's just Kyrie. Mm-hmm. I don't know about the KD. No, that's it, ridiculous. Less than half. It's fucking ridiculous. ridiculous, dog. Yeah. So like, I don't feel any. I don't feel any pity for the for the Nets. Not I'm glad all. they got swept. Me too. Uh, on the other side, Boston's awesome. They might be my favorite team in the league right now. The way that they play, Marcus Smart is again one of my favorite players i think we are seeing the emergence of jason tatum as a top 10 player in this league guy guys become a superstar jalen brown is another star um and it seems to me that they've kind of taken uh what the jazz tried to do in like establishing their defensive identity around their big man because robert williams is fabulous and should be all defense are an all defensive team member this year, but they also have the two way guys necessary to really make everything work. You know, they can switch everything one through five on defense. Their offense is absolutely humming. They just have playmakers and and shot makers all over the court. And I mean, we really could see the Boston Celtics hanging banner number 18 when we're all finished with Mm -hmm. this. They're that good. Number one offense, number one defense in the playoffs right now. Serious. They're so good. They're freaking serious. But is it is it is it Brooklyn being just no no chemistry, no nothing, terrible def- defense, isolation ball, or the Celtics that good? Uh, just just I'm I'm just playing like a little devil's advocate and and kind of countering that. I but mean, I still think the Celtics are serious. Don't get me wrong. I, I, think, I have them coming out of the East right now. Yeah, I think it. that, I mean, part of it, yeah, but they were doing this in the regular season too, just Back. absolutely crushing teams. Mm-hmm. So, like, I think we have a big enough sample size to understand that this team mm-hmm. is serious. Mm-hmm. And Ime Udoka, I thought he was dead in the water. I thought, I didn't know if this guy was going to make it to the All-Star break, and he's completely turned this team around. And this is a team that's absolutely found their identity. And it was so funny in that press conference hearing Kyrie talk about, oh, yeah, you know, the Celtics were able to gel. You know, they've been playing together for a long time now. And it's like, yeah, I wonder why, guy. Man, bro, man. Yeah. Man, oh, man. Again, sucks to suck. Um, RIP Bozos. Yeah. Get out of here. Yeah. I don't want to talk about you guys anymore. Man, oh man. I mean, you guys said it best. I mean, get get these guys out of here. Um, I'm I'm glad, I'm glad they're gone. Tired of the Kyrie antics, tired of the Ben's just seeing that guy's face. The guy's face just pisses me off. Just a punchable face, man. But anyway, also like they gotta get they gotta get rid of Steve Nash, dude. They need an actual got, coach. Yeah, they he just mm. freaking just was a good basketball player and they thought it was gonna translate. Like, come on, guys. <laughs> like, I love on, Steve guys. Nash, great player. You know, like first ballot Hall of Famer, like mm-hmm. one of the greatest of his era. But you got to do a little bit more than roll the ball out and say, get it to Kevin. Man, absolutely. I, that's not all that's right. not a coach's game plan, man. Mm-mm. They need more offense than just Kevin and Kyrie. You man. can't but you can't right. have an offense and defensive game plan based on vibes. <laughs> man, man uh, even especially though, Greg when loves- you, especially when the like the, the vibes of the team are completely fucked. 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> even can't though, do it, hey, man. Like, even though Greg loves the vibes, man. Greg's lo- Greg's feeling the vibes this year, man. I don't but... like bad vibes anymore, man. I just want to watch <laughs> cool, good vibes teams. That's why I'm all in on the Celtics, and I like the Raptors, and I like the Grizzlies. Okay, man. I like we... cool. I like cool, good vibes teams. That's all. That's all I want anymore. Good vibes, <laughs> man. Facts, man. Well. Guys, I think this is a good place for us to go ahead and wrap it up here, man. Man, Greg, thank you so much for blessing us with your knowledge on the jazz, on the NBA, just talking to us. This was great, man. And for all the fans, like, make sure you guys go check out Greg and and, and his uh, his podcast, the Unsalvageable Utah Jazz Podcast. Like he mentioned, he, he runs that with his co-host, Sarah. Check him out. Go show him some love, man, because Greg's a great guy. But, Greg, you got any last words to say before we uh, check off here? I need the Utah Jazz to die. (laughs) That's it, huh? That's it. All I gotta say. That's 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 it. Um, I will be at the funeral. I have the flowers already purchased for the graves. Um, It hurts my heart, but some things, you know, you you need to die in order for rebirth. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. Eventually, my boys will rise from the ashes like a phoenix. Um, and they will replace Phoenix as the best team in the West. Man, that's that's a little take. Man. You heard it here first. Jay, talk to me, man. What's up, my brother? Yeah, Greg, always appreciate you coming on, brother. And then, uh, Thanks, yeah, we'll, we'll, be, we'll be running it back on uh, this weekend for kind of the, yeah, the first round, second round preview episode. Um, so, so G Foster will be back for that. Confirm. Oh, yeah. And, uh, and yeah, that's all I got to say, <laughs> man. All right, man. So for all the, for all the fans, for all the family out there, make sure you like comment, subscribe, check us out on YouTube, Apple podcast, Spotify, leave us a review, man. Leave us a ranking. Uh, make sure you check us out on Instagram, TikTok, Twitter. It's at clutch talk pod. Again, that's at clutch talk pod. Get at us, man. But if all that's out the way, then we out of here. Y'all clutch talk out. Peace. Bye.